This is Greg Tidwell. Thank you for joining me for this series of lessons on God's plumb line. Our theme passage for this series is found in Amos chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. We look at this passage and we see the Lord as a builder, a builder of a wall in this passage in Amos, but a builder who is using a plumb line a plumb line both in the construction of the wall and in the assessment of the wall. We see in various ways that God assesses, that God provides a judgment, a standard. Ultimately, all perfection, all standards reflect the ultimate standard of God himself, his own holiness but let's consider how God's holiness, how his perfection is seen in creation. Creation itself provides a plumb line. God reveals himself through creation. Psalm 19 verses 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. The idea of knowledge, of information, being encoded in the creation around us is something that should not surprise us because God created this world through his knowledge, through his wisdom. The prophet Jeremiah references this. In contrast, to the idols, to the false gods of his age. Jeremiah says of the Lord, it is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. Power, wisdom, understanding. We can see all of that in the created order around us. But more than that, we can see our place in God's creation. Again, from the book of Psalms, Psalm 8, beginning in verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. In this psalm, we read of the majesty of creation, but also of man's place, a place which should be humble before God, but a place where God has given man. The human race has dominion, has power over all creation. When you think in terms of our relationship over the created order, it is one of supremacy. There are animals that will attack people, but no species of animal is effective in hunting people the way that we hunt them. 
even the whales of the sea, if we had not curbed the hunting of them, would have been driven to extinction by the power of mankind. This power, of course, can be misused and mismanaged, but it does tell us something of where we are. We are responsible for the world around us. We are responsible to God, and we should reverently look to him. We see in this, then, the plumb line of creation. What philosophers might refer to as natural law. Going all the way back to Aristotle's work in ethics, we find that astute individuals have looked at the way the world works and have said we can draw moral lessons from that. We can look at how things ought to be because of the standards revealed in the created order. Perhaps the most famous passage dealing with this is the Apostle Paul's description of the natural law in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. He writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The suppression of the truth by unrighteousness. God is wrathful. God is angry at the way the human race has proceeded. But what is their sin? What is their problem? Verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. All right. Now, if you were thinking just about the Jews who had the written word of God, this would be very clear. Or if you went all the way back to the patriarchs where God spoke directly with people, yes, God had told them different things. But this is a description of humanity's accountability before God. How is it that God has shown all the human race certain things to which they are accountable? Verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. We're going to see some specific illustrations of the way in which natural law should instruct people. But just in general, you look at the world and you should know there is a creator, his, his power, his majesty. And you should know something about how the world ought to work. But mankind has rejected this. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their understanding and, fo and their foolish hearts were darkened. This darkening that came is summed up quite simply. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. So it is in our day that those who claim to be wise apart from God, those who have embraced various theories and systems of thought that run counter to God's revelation, they think they are wise, but they are really just fools. In doing this, they enter into idolatry. Verse 23, and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We look at all of this, and idolatry is a real problem. Now, in our age, not many people worship 
carved images or paintings. A few do, in fact, the number is growing that do, but idolatry comes in many forms. Anytime you fail to give thanks to God and honor him, anytime you fail to recognize that he is the one who is in control, if something else is at the center of your attention, whether it is yourself or something else, you have fallen into idolatry. And because of this, there's going to be a judgment. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. God gave them up. God gave them up to dishonor their bodies. It's a common thread that those who turn against God become obsessed with that which is physical. Now, there are some who attempt in some ultra spiritual way to deny the body. But the common flow of mankind is to become materialistic, to become very crass and crude and to worship the creation rather than the creator, the creature. Whether that's us as individuals or that which we see in the created order, because of this, God will give people up. They've exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And what does this judgment of God look like? I'm afraid it looks very much like our own day. Verses 26 and 27, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. Now, as we look at this, we see very clearly that homosexuality, whether of the male homosexual or of the lesbian, is contrary to nature. It is dishonorable. And it is in itself a judgment of God against people who are failing to remember him and failing to look in his revelation, his revelation of his eternal power and of his wisdom as seen in what he has made. They should know that this is not what they ought to do. But closing their hearts to the revelation of God they are given over to this error. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. To do what ought not to be done is the simple statement of what people do whenever they fail to look in to the natural law, when they fail to look at God's absolute perfection that he has revealed in his plumb line, in his standard revealed in creation. Looking at the created order, we should know that there is a holy God who holds us accountable. We didn't make the world. He didn't cause the universe to come into existence, but we are obviously here and we obviously have a status that should teach us about stewardship and accountability. And we should know from biology that God from the beginning made them male and female. And to attempt to upend that 
is foolishness. It's shameful. It is something that ought not to be done. The plumb line of creation calls us into judgment because it is a revelation of a standard that God is using. And the standard he is using is his own holiness. We need to constantly look to God. And one of the ways that we do is by recognizing that he speaks to us through his creation. And we should let that draw us closer to him. And we should seek to honor him as stewards of his creation. And that means as stewards of ourselves as well. Thank you very much for joining me for this class on God's plumb line. I look forward to being with you again in our future lessons.